Hey guys, thanks for joining me again. And today we have something a little bit different. Today we'll be doing some DIY. I have here a pair of speakers that I found at a garage sale for $20. These are a pair of Yamaha NS-AP4400M. These speakers are from around 2005, so almost 20 years old. Let me make a little room so we can open these guys up. Now I did already upgrade the first speaker and we'll be doing the second one together, but I wanted to make sure that it'd be worthwhile even to make the upgrade to make sure there was substantial upgrade in the sound quality. If it was slight, why even make this video? But I'll tell you right now, the improvements are dramatic and I think it'd be well worth it if you found yourself a pair of these at around 20 to 30 bucks. My first listening impressions was I wasted $20 because the sound quality was horrible coming out it as is. The bass is a little bassy, but it's super muffled and really out of control. The mids are non-existent and the highs are super shrill. It's pretty crazy because this is a three-way design and I really did expect more from a brand like Yamaha being one of those older legacy brands. I did do a little research online and there was people out there who thought this was a great sounding speaker. So to each your own on your taste. However, I personally can't listen to this guy as is. So let's take a peek inside and uh, I'll show you what we did. Now we have a little beauty cover ring that goes on top of the speaker and the driver itself. And here's where we run into the first issue. So we have a nice little woofer, paper cone, nice size magnet, it has some heft to it. But the first problem is that there is no crossover network on the woofer. This guy is running full range. So we're running all the frequencies on this woofer right here. Let's take a look at the mid. Same thing here, another little beauty ring. And we have ourselves our mid range driver. Also six ohms. And the mid range's whole crossover network is one capacitor and this guy is a 3.3 microfarad. Now on the six ohm speaker, that makes this a high pass filter at approximately eight kilohertz. So eight kilohertz and above is being played by the mid range. Onto the tweeter. And there's the tweeter. And this tweeter for a crossover has again, just one capacitor. This one is coming in at 1.5 microfarads, which on a six ohm tweeter is approximately around 17 kilohertz, where it crosses probably around 15K-ish around there. So it's acting more like a super tweeter than a tweeter. Both of these little caps are electrolytic capacitors, little tiny guys. And again, the biggest problem is that there's no filter on the woofer here. So this guy's playing all the frequencies that it can, and it's probably going up to around 3000 hertz, where it's gonna start to break up. And beyond there, this guy comes in at around eight kilohertz, maybe going down to six. And then the tweeter is playing over the frequencies of the mid range, giving it a comb filtering effect. So I'll pull out the internal wiring and let's see what we have. So this appears to be about 22 gauge wire. Again, no crossover on the woofer, 3.3 microfarad on the mid range, 1.5 microfarad on the tweeter. So I'll let you hear what that does to the sound. I'll play some royalty free music from Tidal. I'll put my mic next to the speakers and then I'll show you the solution that I came up with and what components we'll be using to upgrade this system here. Now this is not a tutorial on crossover design. I've only been building DIY speakers for about five years. This is my first upgrade that I'm doing to an existing crossover and I'm not a professional. There are many ways to do this. This is just one way and I'm keeping it simple and relatively affordable. I'm using a few amount of components, but I'm spending a little bit of money on them. So I'm getting nice quality parts. On this upgrade, I'll break down the prices for you and you can decide if it's worth investing to you or if cheaper components would be a better solution. First, we need an amplifier. We have our Doke H7 Pro and I'll bring in my iPad to play the music. I have a royalty free track now and I'll move the other two speakers out of the way. And this is what we're gonna hear with the full range signal. So that's an approximate because this isn't in the box. The box of course is gonna change it. But here's what we're gonna do. 
we're gonna add a 1.3 millihenry inductor. Now this is a Janssen air core inductor and this is the 18 gauge. This unit is going to act as our first order filter and it is gonna be our low pass filter. And this is gonna allow around 800 hertz to pass through. This is what it will sound like instead. So that's just a quick example. This is playing higher frequencies that it doesn't have to be. Taking that away with this inductor is gonna allow this to have cleaner bass because it's only handling the bass notes. The price on this inductor is at $13.14. If you wanna go a little bit cheaper, you can get the 20 gauge. Now we'll go on to the mid range. For our mid range, we'll need a bandpass filter. The bandpass filter allows us to control the lows and the highs. So we will start off with a capacitor. This is gonna be our high pass filter. This is a 40 microfarad by Clarity Cap in their PX series. This guy comes in around $23, but I got it back when it was on sale for around 18 and I just had it on a different project and didn't end up using this one. I switched values, so I had it laying around. And this one will allow frequencies of a little bit over 850 hertz to come across to this speaker. And we will add on an inductor. And this inductor will roll off the frequencies passing around seven kilohertz. And here's what this sounds like. Again, without this filter. So on that one you can hear quite a bit less of the bass when we have the 3.3 which is what was built into the unit and with the new network we have quite a bit more vocals coming out of the mid-range. And onto the tweeter and on the highs we'll just be using one capacitor. We're using a Janssen standard polypropylene cap and this is a 3.9 microfarad which should get us a crossover at around 7k and above on the tweeter. Again the one that was built in was a 1.5 giving us somewhere around 17k and above and of course, it does roll down a little lower. Same thing here, it's not a dead cutoff at seven kilohertz. It does roll off gradually a little lower as well, but that's where we want the crossover on this one. So that one's doing a little bit more work, but we're not having the frequencies blend together on top of each other. I also would like to thank a few creators that have given me quite a bit of knowledge on the construction of these crossovers. First of all, Marcus over at Audio Judgment. He has a wonderful set of courses over on Udemy and I purchased all of his courses and learned quite a bit. Then there's Toids DIY, which has a wonderful tutorial on XSIM, which helped me simulate the crossover points of these components. And of course, Danny Ritchie over at GR Research with his vast knowledge of components, I built his XLS Encore all souped up with the best parts and that's an amazing sounding speaker. But let's see what this Yamaha can do. Let's get this crossover put together. So I had some leftover crossover boards here and I pre-drilled the board to set up our pieces. So first I'll drop in our inductor. I've got some zip ties right here. And you don't want to use any metal wire. You want to stick with nylon here or plastic. You don't want anything conductive to go inside of the inductor. Make it nice and tight so it doesn't move in your speaker. And we'll clip our ends. So that's our low pass filter for our woofer. Now we'll add our second inductor and whenever you have inductors next to each other, less than about five, six inches, you don't want to have them the same direction. You want to have them so if one is next to it, it'll roll into it. This will cancel out any fields that might interfere with each other. Now you don't want it like this, you want it like that. We 
can cut off that end. Now on to our large capacitor. On this one, I'll need two zip ties because mine weren't long enough. If you had longer ones, that won't be a problem. Clip the ends there. Now the smaller inductor will get tied together with the 40 microfarad capacitor for the mid-range network. And we want to tighten as tight as we can. We want a mechanical connection on these cables. Some people will just solder on top of there, but you really do want it tight. The solder will only go on top of that, but you want it super tight. You'll find that on the directions of the solder as well. It says make that mechanical connection first, as tight as you can, then apply the solder. That's ready to solder there. We don't need this top portion of the lead. And finally, our last capacitor. And there's our crossover here. We have our woofer crossover, which is going to be our low pass filter. We have our mid range, which is our band pass. And we have our tweeter, which is our high pass filter. So we'll tie this point, this point, and this point together into our plus line. Then this will go to our tweeter. This will go to our mid range. And then this will go to our woofer, all the pluses. The negatives will all just go back down into the negative side of the terminal. So I'll go outside, get this soldered. I'll mount it up into the speaker and we'll take a listen. All right guys, so I'm back installing the second crossover on the second speaker and here's what I did on both of these. It took me about an hour each to get these installed because I left the internal wire alone and I had to kind of maneuver around it. And what I did is I added these little jacks that are banana onlys. You can also add on the five way binding posts, but I really only use bananas. So for me, this is easier. I like them nice and flush right there. So I got bananas down at the bottom one. Or if we want to hear what the original crossover sounds like, we can put our regular bare wires into the little spring clips, which I didn't mess around with. So now I'll put them on my main system and I'll put the speaker switcher. So one set of speakers will be here. The second one will be here. And then when we get our control for our switcher and we switch over channel A and channel B, we'll be listening to the built-in crossover or the new upgraded crossover. So we'll go and take a listen, but I'll tell you automatically what I heard with one speaker. When I had the first speaker set up, I was sitting directly in front of the speaker. Now the sound, again, the bass is super bloated, very loose, and the highs are very shrill, and not very much in the mid-range at all. And when I was testing the first speaker, I was using the Solo Peak switcher, and on A, I had the new upgraded crossover, and on B, I had the original crossover. So I was able to switch quickly to listen to the differences. And automatically when I switched over to the new crossover, I'll tell you that something very much surprised me. The original crossover was super, super flat, but the upgraded had a ton of layering. And I always thought that the layering was an effect of the stereo image. So now I'm thinking that layering must be a function of the frequency separation, because once we had those frequencies separated nice and evenly, I had a bunch of layers, not so much behind, but in front of the speaker, maybe two, three feet going forward. So we'll see what it sounds like with both speakers up in the system, and I'll give you guys my opinion in a minute.
I also put those speakers through a few different tracks and one of them was Amy Whitehouse Back to Black. And on that track, the most notable detail that I caught was definitely the imaging. With the stock crossover, everything seemed to be flat and Amy's vocals seemed to be kind of everywhere in the center. The second I switched it over, she was dead center, boom. So everything came into focus in the center of the speakers and I got her a little behind the speakers. It gave me a great sense of imaging, good amount of space with some instrument separation, but it wasn't giant. The depth of the sound stage was maybe three feet. On the width, maybe six inches to a foot outside of the speakers. With the stock crossover, I was getting the width right at the edge of the speakers. Again, no layering, everything seemed to be flat and muddled quite a bit. A great improvement for the price. Overall, I think it was a good investment to throw a little bit of money into the speaker. It was a $20 yard sale find and we threw about $90 in parts into it. And that's with polypropylene caps and 18 gauge air core inductors. I did some math. If we used electrolytic capacitors and 20 gauge inductors, that brought the price down to $15 per speaker. So a total of $30 for an upgrade. Now, whether that crossover with lesser parts quality would sound as good as the current one that I built is an unknown, but that's the fun thing about this hobby. This is more of a learning exercise and just to have fun. After I have a few friends over to listen to the differences in the sound quality, I'll go ahead and find a good home for these speakers. All right guys, I'll see you on the next one and thanks for watching.